Um, I'm Andrea Udeboy. I'm a professor in the English department, uh, along with my colleague Kathy Newman, who's also a professor in English. I'm in the rhetoric program. Kathy is in the literary culture studies program. And our authors, our featured authors today, are also our colleagues in English. Doc Colson, who's a professor in rhetoric, and Greg Lasky, who's a professor of first year writing. So the, the genre that we're starting today is really different from what we normally have with academic presentations. Um, these are not going to be academic papers. We're not even necessarily going to read from the books themselves, although if the authors were planning on doing that, don't feel like you have to change your plans <laughs> at the last minute. Um, we are interested in showcasing the research and scholarship in the humanities that is uh, not only deeply erudite and deeply historical and informed by important theories and concepts and methods in the field, but also research that speaks very directly to some of the biggest challenges of our time. So this is work that is impactful and significant. Um, the English department does this kind of work all the time. Our scholars and colleagues work about work on citizen science, they work on arranged marriage, they work on environmental matters, and they work on immigration, and they work on issues of racism and slavery. Um, and these remain questions that we don't have answers for. So in the kind of scientific and technological problem-solving environment at Carnegie Mellon where it's all about fixing things and finding the right answer, I think it's sometimes really interesting to see what are the questions for which we do not have answers. Um, and what are some of the ways in which we can think about those answers? And these are books that do that in brilliant ways. Um, so we're starting today this particular genre. It's very conversational. We're going to present very briefly the books. And we strongly encourage you to read them. And the authors will tell you more about um, the arguments and the research that they present in, in their books. And essentially, Kathy and I, as the hostesses, are um, each in charge of one of the books and one of the authors. So I'll be asking Doug questions, and Kathy will be asking Greg questions. But we'll switch at some point, and we'll just be simply talking. And then we'll invite all of you to talk as well. And again, we're, we're really avoiding a kind of relatively stiff, stiff academic format and really interested in a conversation. Maybe we'll even have some answers uh, at the end of today. So. With that being said, I think just to give you a sense of our timeline, we, we plan on spending about half an hour, 35 minutes, just amongst ourselves. Although, if you see us going in the wrong direction, stop us and you know, <laughs> set us straight. And then after that, we'll just hope that all of you can join us as well. So uh, let me start by uh, very briefly introducing Doug Colson's book, which is called Race, Nation, and Refuge, The Rhetoric of Race in Asian American Citizenship cases. And this is a book that makes an intervention in immigration and naturalization debates and looks at a series of uh, very important cases in early naturalization law that took into account race without necessarily explicitly setting out to talk about race. So these are legal battles where the, um, where the defendant, I suppose, was trying to acquire um, American citizenship. And Oftentimes, in all of these cases, they ended up having to defend themselves not just as immigrants who, had, who would be welcome in the United States, but also as people who were white, when in fact their own race was sometimes actually not quite clear, rather under question. Um, a former civil trial lawyer, Doc Olson draws on his legal expertise to investigate a wide array of documents, briefs, trial transcripts, judicial opinions, as well as congressional hearings and internal documents from the United States Bureau of Naturalization in the study of racial classifications that emerged discursively in legal disputes surrounding citizenship and naturalization. Doug Olson's research is historically informed as he works with several archives that he can tell you more about and relevant to critical contemporary concerns about race, citizenship, and sovereignty. His case studies range across um, a wide variety of immigrant groups, and some of these groups are, maybe the names themselves are not going to be immediately recognizable to you, but that's part of the issue here, that he's talking about national, national formations that are themselves very much um, defined by how the United States sees those countries at that time. So these groups are Arabs, Armenians, Arab Indians, Chinese, Filipinos, Japanese, Kalmyks? Kalmyks? Kalmyks. Kalmyks. Syrians and Tatars. 
Focusing on these groups, Doc Olson offers a rhetorical history of the racial eligibility requirements of the early naturalization legislation and makes a key contribution to our understanding of nation building, border making, and the construction of race in America. While Marx's scholarship on race in the United States is framed literally in black and white terms, who's white, who's black, Colson argues based on historical and legal evidence that racial classifications are embedded in larger political arguments about sovereignty, perceived external threats to the nation state and foreign policy. He shows that naturalization petitions were most effective if the applicants appeared white and that they constructed the appearance of a white identity by arguing that they had fled countries considered enemies of the United States. Having a common enemy, what Doug and other scholars in rhetoric refer to as enmeship, the opposite of, I guess, friendship, uh, functioned on ground, as grounds for whiteness regardless of how other kinds of racialized elements, like for example, physical appearance or ancestry or cultural affiliation would have classified a person. Um, so that's been a very brief summary Doc Olson's book, and Kathy, if you want to say a little bit about Greg Lasky's, and then we'll start with some questions. Yes. Um, uh, Lasky's book is called Untimely Democracy, the Politics of Progress uh, After Slavery. Uh -huh. Yeah. And this is a book that does something I really appreciate. It's a book about American literature that centers African American authors, but that it's really about American politics and American progress. Uh, the, the work features uh, Frederick Douglass's writing, Pauline Hopkins, Stephen Crane, W. Du Bois, Charles Chestnut, and Walt Whitman, among others. Um, and I wanted to just briefly read a Whitman quote uh, that starts the book that I think gets at some of the issues. Uh, Whitman writes, the abolition of slavery and the extirpation of the slaveholding class makes incomparably the longest advance for radical democracy, utterly removing its only real dangerous impediment and ensuring its progress in the United States and thence, of course, over the world. So this is a very optimistic uh, quote from Whitman. Um, and I was reminded in reading this book uh, about the title of one of Whitman's uh, famous poetry collections, Chance Democratic. Does anybody remember what the subtitle of Chance Democratic was? The subtitle is And Native American. So I think Whitman sort of embodies the tensions that Lasky is writing about. That this is sort of our most progressive democratic author in a certain way in the 19th century who also was a nativist and who campaigned for, uh, when he said Native American rights, he didn't mean Native American Indian, he meant uh, whites born in the United States. Um, so this is a book that really asks from the point of view of the turn of the last century, why have we made so little progress on racial equality since slavery? Why has the case for reparations failed? And I'm struck by, by these questions still uh, being the questions that we're asking today. I don't know if any of you saw a recent report that shows that over the last 50 years, if we measure uh, progress uh, for equality in terms of wealth, income, and levels of home ownership, for African Americans, uh, that progress has either stayed the same or retreated over the last 50 years. So I think these questions of progress and why aren't we making it are really questions of today. Um, Lasky's interesting sort of technique is to raise the question of time and who controls it. He says that this book is partly about who has the right to give, extract, and keep time. And so I'm struck thinking about one of the chapters in uh, volume one of Marx's Capital about the working day, and thinking that, uh, that whoever is in, in power to the extent that they can control time, that they can really control democracy and its limits. Um, and interestingly, Lasky finds in a variety of American literature, including Stephen Crane's novella, Monster, the idea that we are responsible for the atrocities of our ancestors as well as potentially our progenitors. Um, and I want to end with one paragraph from the book that I found very inspiring. Um, it's a little bit of a, of a not inspiring book. Uh, in the sense that it's, it's about uh, the progress we haven't made. 
But this I really liked. It's okay. You don't have to be inspiring when you're talking about the truth. Um, so this is uh, this is a moment where Frederick Douglass is speaking. Um, and he's speaking in, in 1895. He's talking about his most recent uh, version of his autobiography, Life and Time. When asked by a member of the rising generation of black Americans what the young Negro just starting out should do for the race, the aged leader replied, agitate, agitate, agitate. Um, and so I thought, that is for me the, the, the one of the inspiring messages I, I do take from this work. And I thank you for it. Thank you. So I'll start by asking you a question, Doug. So I mentioned your background as a lawyer, and I think that was uh, indispensable for the kind of understanding that you were able to bring to the legal archives that you analyzed. And um, since becoming a rhetorician and joining our department and being a scholar in rhetoric, you've also been in active dialogue with um, the legal scholarly community as well as the rhetorical scholarly community. So. Um, you know, lawyers and rhetoricians have been your your partners all the time. So, how would you, how do you imagine a book like yours would be read by someone who's primarily involved in legal matters? Um, you know, and it could be an immigration lawyer, it could be, uh, it could be a judge. It's the people who are actually actively making this legal history that you are tracing from a scholarly perspective. Do you? Do you imagine them arguing against you or having aha moments by reading your book? I think that uh, legal scholars are different than lawyers. So as a practicing lawyer, my perspective informs uh, this book and the way I read the archives. Um, legal scholars tend to look for policy uh, making uh, points and they're not as interested in the sort of practice issues, the application, so much as the formulation of rules. And so I don't know how the legal scholarly community would read it. I think there are scholars who do sociological jurisprudence who would be interested, um, a number of scholars who, who are interested in language and law who would be interested. Uh, but the reason I think there's a separation of law and rhetoric and I prefer to be doing rhetoric, is that uh, the rhetorical dimension of law is often marginalized in uh, classic legal scholarship. And so that, in a way, is my motivation for doing this kind of I guess what I was, uh, just a quick follow-up, what I was hoping you would say, and it's just a utopian hope, <laughs> is that a book like yours can actually draw attention to some fundamental injustices in naturalization and immigration law. Well, I think it can. To the people who yeah. can actually change those. Sure, I think it can. The implications are complicated in the sense that this is a historical yeah. book, so it's already been completed. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a Naturalization Act that requires a racial eligibility uh, threshold anymore. But I, what I do think the book calls attention to that could be useful to policymaking is how I, I connect the appeals uh, that I point to in terms of applicants for naturalized citizenship having to frame themselves as victims of a common adversary of the United States to political asylum law in which uh, people seeking asylum are often not uh, admitted as frequently when they're claiming a persecution by an, uh, a ally of the United States compared to an adversary. Mm -hmm. And that still goes on. So this fundamental dynamic, I think, is still there. Mm -hmm. So um, one of my questions for you, Greg, you, your epilogue ends with Obama's election. And this was your dissertation. Mm -hmm. I presume so it was kind of conceived and written during that time period. Uh -huh. What do you think are some of the lessons that we could take away from this book in our kind of current political? I mean, I feel like you're anticipating it in a in a certain way uh -huh. with the, the sort of persistence of white supremacy and the almost a compression of time uh -huh. uh, that we see with, with, with Trump's election. I didn't mean to. I <laughs> 
I think, so as I wrote the book, um, many of you recall one of the most inspiring parts, I think, of President Obama's campaign was um, the, the, the posters that, that reflected these verbs, right? Um, hope, change, and then one of them was progress. Mm -hmm. And so I think that President Obama so powerfully taps into this notion that we have in American democracy that democracy requires progress, the future has to be better than the past, and that the narrative of steady progress is something that we have to hew to even in spite of. Um, and so if you remember um, on the inauguration night in Chicago, President Obama mentioned that this is, his election is, is precisely what the founders dreamed of. But of course, depending on which founders you're thinking about, that's, that's not true. <laughs> uh, and so I think that um, in the book, I try to trace this emphasis on the connection between the progress narrative and the narrative of American democracy from Thomas Jefferson and um, through Whitman. I actually did not know that, Kathy, about the subtitle, Chance Democratic. But, yeah. but Whitman so powerfully um, articulates that notion. And so I think that the second half of the 19th century and the writers who I study in the book would ask us to think about how we measure progress. And so is there a way to think about the good imperatives that we would associate with progress? And one of the tensions I find in the book is that Frederick Douglass, other figures who are writing in the 1870s, 1880s, none of those figures would renounce progress as an aim or a desire. Um, the path that we take to reach the progress is what they're interrogating. So the, the notion of how you measure the relationship between the past and the present, and so often in, in our narrative of American democracy, the past serves as the foil to the present. And so the present is better, the past was bad, and um, mixing, trying to trying to mess with that, with that measurement. Um, I guess the other question is what do we make of the resurgence of um, the bad past in the present. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like your story is one almost of compressed time mm -hmm. or, or time that's out of order. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this, it feels, to me, it feels like we're out of order mm -hmm. uh, with where I would like to be. Um, mm -hmm. But this, the, the 19th century tells us that something like what we're going through right now could happen. Yeah, I think that's, I never thought about it in quite those terms, but the notion of, of what is the state of being out of order versus being in order. And so there may, has anyone read um, W. Du Bois's book, Souls of Black Folk? He has this great phrase called the present past, and he actually makes it a compound term. And so I try to use that as an example of what it would mean to be in sync, out of sync, in order, or out of order. But what would happen if you put um, the past after the present? And if you mark the way that the past continues to animate the present, I think that may be one way to consider our current moment. Yeah. Well, both your books are so historical. Um, you know, not the same period necessarily, but also not things that are happening right now. And at the same time, the cases that you're documenting look eerily similar to some of the cases that are happening today. So have you, do you see progress? You don't talk specifically about progress in your account, Doug, but um, is there progress across the cases that you're looking at? And is there a way to imagine progress beyond them? So you talked about the fact that there is no longer a racial eligibility requirement in naturalization law. You don't have to be white in order to uh, be allowed to um, acquire American citizenship. But there are other limitations, there are other constraints, there are other eligibility requirements. Um, what do you think of progress along these lines? Yeah, I, I don't see uh, necessarily that much progress. What, <clears throat> what I focus on is this common enemy uh, move in these cases and in racial formation discourse more generally. And what, what often happens, this is a unification around a, a common external threat that causes groups to temporarily sometimes suspend their differences, including uh, the perception of racial difference. 
but the, the sort of temporary nature of that is often a route to kind of backsliding uh, after that moment of harmonious unity around a, a common goal of some kind. And then it will be temporary. So when the war is over, that, that sentiment will be, for example. And so what uh, I see in the naturalization context in the early 20th century are moments of groups uh, unifying together to be uh, perceived as free white persons is the statutory phrase at the expense of other groups quite often. Uh, so with regard to the Arminian case that I study in the, in the book, uh, they obtained their whiteness through a, an argument that demonized Islamic groups in Asia Minor at the time, Turks, Kurds, and Syrian Muslims. And that was a thematic argument throughout the case. And so there's that trade-off where you're also abandoning uh, another group and reifying uh, racial categories. Uh, but also when the, when the naturalization provisions uh, that included race were removed in 1952, it didn't really bring about any uh, great sort of influx of immigrants. It allowed people to fulfill quotas uh, for immigration from the 1924 Immigration Act, but those quotas were already uh, skewed toward European immigration. So there were quotas as low as 100 or uh, something like the whole area of Turkey. Uh, so it, you know, for China, I think had 100 immigrants per year. That were allowed. So they were no longer racially uh, barred from coming in, but the, uh, under the Naturalization Act and immigration provision, uh, that linked into that, but they were still limited based upon a racial uh, perception and mapping that they were. So in other words, the racial dimension became associated with entire nations. It did, and it also just sort of went underground. It was more invisible. It was invisible. I want to ask a question that's um, a little bit more about literature. I really like the way you centered African American writers in a story about American democracy. And I guess I, my PhD is in American studies, and I felt like when I was coming up in graduate school in the 90s, African American literature was sort of its own stream. And I wondered kind of what inspired you to put it at the center of American literature to, to tell the story you're trying to tell in, in this book. I think two things. Um, in some of you may know, that probably the most famous formative text of the 19th century American literature was written by a professor, F. O. Matheson, called The American Renaissance. And this is how we get um, the canon of Emerson, Whitman, Thoreau, and others, those we still study. And so when American literature, as you know, had to make a case for itself as different from British literature, that was one way that the field got consolidated, which was these figures. And Matheson said that these authors were committed to the possibilities of American democracy. This is the sort of rationale. And so um, related to that for me, as someone who works in the second half of the 19th century, and I always joke that this is my scholarly axe to grind, is there's like 1800 to 1865, and then the rest of the 19th century disappears. <laughs> and I think part of that is a function of the legacy of the American Renaissance, but I think another part of it is that many of the authors working in the second half of the 19th century on these questions mm -hmm. outside of Twain um, are African-American authors. And so two questions there for me. What, what is so, I, I say in the book that there's, there's an excitement to abolition and the run-up to the Civil War, and then the Civil War happens. But by that standard, it's, it's as if the second half of the 19th century seems boring in some it's, way. It's anticlimactic. Yes, yeah. yes. And a friend pointed this out to me, and I, I never made the connection, but think about the names for the second half of the 19th century, the one that we probably know or have more readily at our fingertips is the Gilded Age. Right. But um, some of you may know that uh, Rayford Logan, a historian writing in the 1950s, had another name for this era, which was the Nadir. And he brings that from the... Um, the, the spatial notion of the point opposite the zenith. And he is referring, of course, to um, racial history, yeah. um, Jim Crow, lynching. And, and so I would say that both within and 
and beyond the university, we probably still know the Gilded Age um, more than we know the Nadir. Yeah. And so to me, I think, um, considering the second half of the 19th century from that perspective necessarily brings us to the voices yeah. that I um, study. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm, I just taught a unit on the Gilded Age in the inequality class. Uh, that I'm team teaching uh, with uh, Mark Hamlet, Paul Ice, and Cody Manke. It's a, one of the Dietrich College Grand Challenge seminars. And I was using Jack Beatty's notion of the age of betrayal, mm -hmm. which I felt like your book resonated with really well, which is sort of the promises of democracy that the Civil War held forth that were not delivered. So, Doug, what's the time span in your book? What What is the... What's the history part in yours, and what are the promises happening in the background at the time? So you end basically around World War II. That's when you end. That's the last case that you discuss. So what is the, where does it begin, and what's happening at the time in the United States that is really influencing how we think about immigration and race in this period? Well, the, the first Naturalization Act was 1790. Uh, but between yeah. then and World, uh, sorry, the Civil War, there were no uh, cases that we have any evidence of or any records of in which people were denied naturalization based upon this provision. So the original 1790 Act required that a person be a quote-unquote free white person uh, to be eligible to become a naturalized citizen. Uh, after the Civil War, uh, Charles Sumner, the senator, proposed to take that racial language out of the statute as part of Reconstruction. And West Coast uh, senators uh, objected uh, violently in some ways uh, based upon the, the influx of Chinese immigrants to the West Coast. And so it was uh, this, this uh, history of cases sort of emerged from a fear of the Chinese. And Sinophobia. And the compromise that was made is that they grafted, they left the original language and then they grafted in a section that also allowed Africans to become naturalized citizens. Not that many Africans were wanting to become citizens at that time <laughs> from outside the country, but it, it solved the reconstruction problem without taking uh, the racial dimension out. And based upon that legislative history, a lot of people perceived uh, the continuation of that language as an, an Asian exclusion policy, that Asians were neither uh, white nor African, so they were racially uh, ineligible. So you have the, the Chinese uh, issue in the 19th century, but there were still not a lot of cases until the turn of the 20th century. And so what happened at the turn of the 20th century is you had a lot of immigrants uh, from India and other areas of Western Asia uh, coming to the United States. And there were objections at the local level to a lot of these uh, people, including people from the Middle East as well. Uh, what also happened is the Bureau of Naturalization was formed in 1906. And surprisingly, they uh, took a very political interpretation of this uh, language. The, the key language was the free white persons uh, part. Not many people were claiming uh, to be African as a, as a means of becoming a citizen. Uh, but a lot of Asians claimed that they were free white persons uh, and eligible for citizenship. And there were some objections, and you have these cases where what I think is really fascinating about them is that you have a record of arguments on both sides in a contested case debating why or why somebody was not uh, a free white person or what racial classification was proper uh, to them and introducing evidence and so on and so forth. What I mainly focus on is the effect of World War I and World War II uh, on these cases. So the wars brought about a number of exemptions for uh, soldiers <coughs> who had uh, served in the U.S. military, and just in general, uh, for people around the wartime periods, there was a, a retreat from these uh, racial wars. Yeah, I found your focus on, on these two major wars 
very interesting because um, the groups you're looking at are not the groups that come to mind when we think about World War II and World War I. I mean, you were talking about the Japanese for sure, but um, obviously the Germans would have been of European descent. So even though they were subject to a lot of discrimination at the time, German Americans, by being uncontroversially white and European, they had a completely different path to naturalization. Yeah, it's interesting. They, they were sort of un, uncontroversially white in many ways, but uh, wartime propaganda, both in World War I and World War II from the United States, framed the Germans as Huns uh, associated with the Mongol invasion of history. And what you see in some of the posters during uh, those periods when they're called Huns is also a darkening of their skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, for me, Greg, your book also raises a question of citizenship. You know, Du Bois says at the end of the 19th century, the Negro is not free. And in our inequality class, we've been looking at prison uh, data. So right now, uh, an African-American man born in the 1990s has a one in three chance of, of ending up in prison. And so I'm wondering about your thoughts about citizenship and what is sort of our progress on that question. Uh, of citizenship for, for all? It's a, it's a great question. Since I see one of my students here, I think one of your students too, um, I always, always say on the first day, why are you, why are you in college? And um, Andrew Del Banco read a great book called College, What It Was, Is, and Should Be. Um, and if you haven't read it, you should check it out. And he, he reminds us that one of the primary functions of the university was, and he argues should be, this notion of preparation for democratic citizenship. Um, and so I think that probably my sense, and this is no reflection on my wonderful students, but I, I think that we've lost that notion of, um, of education as a preparation for citizenship, especially I think the, the K through 12 level as well, when there's this emphasis on skills and testing. economic, yeah, yeah and, and testing. And so um, I think in terms of the book though, one of the values of democratic citizenship that Du Bois alludes to, and I try to make a case that um, this is the big absence in Jefferson, is if we think about the values of, of democracy and what it means to be a citizen, we generally consider equality and liberty. And we have thought of, about the tensions and the, the harmonies between equality and liberty for a long time. But um, both of those values exist in some time frame, some time scale. And so we, we tend to think about liberty and equality as, as if they're neutral historically, as they're in a vacuum. And so what would happen if we put equality and liberty in time, in history, and then I try to argue in the book that temporality, um, who controls time, who defines it, should be a, a third value. And so for Jefferson, it was so important to sever the relationship between yeah. the past and the present because in his vision that was the only way that we could have um, slavery and democracy right yeah. right and it's of course precisely about that issue for him um and so i think du bois is corrective as a political philosopher is to think about the responsibility between generations and how do you um how do you and this is a this is a question that i think has no answer at least for me but how do you conceive of um a commitment across generations. Yeah. Um, and what would that, how would one even realize that in all the senses of realize in a democratic political system? You know, speaking of um, citizenship, Doug, you're writing about individuals who have come to this country and who want citizenship more than anything else. And it gives them safety. It allows them to make a living. In some cases, it allows them to live because you know if they were forced to return, their lives would be endangered. And then they go through these uh, trials and tribulations, trials literally, to acquire citizenship. And you have to wonder, how do they come out of these uh, legal battles in terms of their understanding of, of what it means to be an American citizen? So we know what they needed to say in order to acquire it. We know what case their lawyers made on their behalf. But when it was all said and done, um, what do you think was their understanding of American citizenship? I know it's a very big question, but you know your book is about big questions. Yeah, uh, I don't know really. I mean, they, I didn't study as much of the biographical information. Uh, there's not a lot of that that's extant 
Mr. Cartusian, there's no biography about him. No. That's too bad. Uh, but, That's the Armenian gentleman. Uh, yeah, but the ones I know about were, were bitter about it. It's not that they didn't yeah. uh, appreciate the value of citizenship when they obtained it, mm -hmm. and not all of them did. But um, even those who obtained it were, I think, jaded and a little bit embittered by the experience of being opposed in that way. With regard to the Arminians, there, there's a lot of uh, complexity uh, to the cases in that the Bureau of Naturalization took a, a, uh, a fluid role in uh, opposing certain categories of people according to, to meet foreign policy objectives. And they were more focused on the character of individual applicants and to some extent their group than they were on being consistent uh, with their interpretation. So they were singling out certain people for uh, opposition to their citizenship based upon uh, their political activities and other considerations while favoring uh, other groups. And I think all of that kind of complicated how the litigants felt about it. It was the political branch of government being uh, political. You, when you said earlier that the uh, Bureau of Naturalization um, in 1906 mm -hmm. read um, the previous, uh, the 1790 racial eligibility criterion politically, um, and you said surprisingly. Were you being sarcastic? Because uh, to me, it, the Bureau of right. Naturalization would always read such things politically. Right, so it's unsurprising in the sense that I just said that they're part of the political branch mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. government. I think it is surprising to most readers today in I light see. of our, uh, where we are with regard to race today. I think a lot of people, including previous scholars who looked at these cases, assumed that they would find a kind of invisibility mm -hmm. uh, to race at the time as sort of color blindness. It's not openly spoken about. And what you, what you find to me is surprisingly openly political regard to race. And very racialized in general. And very racialized in general. And what they, what the Bureau of Naturalization did in interpreting free white persons uh, was to reject the ocular inspection test. You can't tell by the color of the skin, for example, or any other visual uh, signs, whether somebody's a, a quote unquote white person. Uh, and, and they abandoned uh, racialist science, uh, for the most part, whether somebody's a Caucasian or an Aryan, which you, you know, one is an ethnological grouping, the other is philological based on language. Uh, but they, they said it was Western civilization and its values, whatever that meant. And so it was about whether certain groups uh, were inured, as they called it, to, to the, the values of America. And so it kind of included, they included uh, Jews and other uh, groups from the Middle East as part of the formation of Western civilization. They recognized uh, colonialism and the spread of, of Western civilization through that. But they were also sort of making it up as they went according to the State Department's interests. Okay, so we have been talking for 35 minutes. I wrote down what our what that would be. So we, we also <laughs> want to ask um, a couple of questions about you as authors, you yeah. know, not just your books. So maybe we can segue to that. Thanks for... Um, so you want to ask Greg a question about... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious about process. Um, what, uh, you know, maybe how this moved from a dissertation to a book. Uh, maybe moments where you got really frustrated with the project and, and how you kind of broke through to finishing it. Um, so when I got really frustrated with the project, I stopped working on it and <laughs> wrote a, ended up writing an article about something totally different. Smart. Um, and so that worked. Yeah. Um, my former dissertation advisor suggested that when you're at an impasse, do something different. And I think about it as cross-training in a way. Yeah. And, and yeah. It, it worked for me. I don't know. If I'm, not, I'm not as good with the physical cross-training. But, <laughs> but you I need think, the right shoes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that the big question, and this is um, something that we as humanists and literary scholars in particular, there is a problem with book production um, 
and at least every editor I met with um, chastise us as people who don't don't read each other's books, don't support each other's books. And so as someone who's writing about the second half of the 19th century, um, it's a really tough sell because there's not that much of a... Um, it's not a field. No, no. And um, as, what did some, someone wrote me a really good email. Um, there's just no market for that. <laughs> <laughs> How can there be no market right, for the right, second right. half of the 19th century? I, <laughs> I think, so... Uh, this the is, book was published by Oxford in the end, so it's, yeah. it's a story, but I'm very happy yeah, the, the market has been found. I will, I will, so this, one more anecdote that will circle back to, to your question. It was when, I, when I was writing The Dust Jacket, um, the book, as, I, as I've tried to mention, is, is really about the second half of the 19th century, and so I was explaining to my um, academic friends that I'm, I'm really intervening in the postbellum period. This is my contribution. And so when I uh, sent the dust jacket copy describing the book to a friend who's a journalist in Pittsburgh, and I said, I really want to reach a general audience with this book about the postbellum. And his response was, you might begin by dropping the term postbellum. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I think that um, that the way that I moved from the dissertation to the book was in fact by trying to make it a more intense cultural history of precisely that moment, but I started calling it after the Civil War yeah. instead. Um, and so one of the one of the ways I, I revised was to sort of drop the overarching narrative of moving from Thomas Jefferson to Barack Obama in the book and, and bring those past and present moments to the introduction and the epilogue and try to um, recreate the very intense historical moment where these issues to me were exploding. I think it works. It was a good idea. <laughs> Doug, your book was also originally a dissertation. So what about your process from um, transitioning from a thesis to a book manuscript and now the book? I think in some ways it was similar. I tried to make it more accessible to a general readership in a lot of ways. There's a lot of complex legal material. And as you mentioned at the beginning, there, there are groups that people are not familiar with historically. So I tried to smooth a lot of that out, but what I also added uh, that is not in the dissertation is an entire chapter where I go over the Bureau of Naturalization's role, as I was just talking about. Uh, based, I had some new archival work that informed uh, the book, some of which I found very exciting after the dissertation that was very corroborating of arguments I was already working on. Uh, I also introduced grammatical translativity into uh, the book after the dissertation. I was working with uh, a category of kind of active and passive voice, which was not precise enough for the work uh, that I was trying to do with the book. And so I won't try to really explain transitivity to you fully, but it's, mm -hmm. it's more complicated than whether a verb is transitive or intransitive. And it doesn't only even involve the verb, so it's it's a complex set of factors that allow me uh, to refine my analysis, and it changed some of the analysis. As well. So you enrich the book, and mm -hmm. transitivity is certainly a lot of Paul Hopper's work is about that, right. and right. it was a good place to come, Carnegie Mellon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What about, I, I, I do know that the two of you did work together, to, I mean, coll not collaborated per se, but exchanged interesting questions and answers um, even before Greg came here. So how would a scholar of immigration and naturalization and race uh, talk to a scholar of um, slavery and um, its legacy and vice versa? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, the, the one connection I noted is uh, Kathy read the um, epigraph from Whitman, and I saw from the intro to your book that you also begin with Whitman. Yes, from the death of Abraham Lincoln. Uh -huh. So he uh, talks about the death of Abraham Lincoln as a galvanizing event. So, it's, so I use that as an epigraph for the kind of galvanization that I'm uh, looking at with regard to unifying around the common history. So I think Whitman, interestingly, is one connection, one right? Yeah. right? Uh, Whitman, uh, no. Okay. Stay with Whitman. 
Well, I mean, I am interested in race and uh, racial rhetoric in general, so I don't think there's that much separation between a rhetorical uh, perspective and, and a literary one, especially when we're both doing history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, a similar emphasis on, on the, the force of language, what, what language does um, in the world, I think in the case of my book, it's trying to come up with a new way to imagine um, democracy, really. What's, how can you have progress toward the values of liberty and equality for all without at the same time committing yourself to a progressive vision of time that would force the past to say in the past in the problematic way? And so I, th I think in, in my case, I turn to narratives, which might be novels, they might be essays, anything that, that tells a story. Yeah. Um, and, and thinking about the force of that story for imagining other possibilities and formations. And I think for me as well, I was studying really the, a lot of imaginaries about um, the, the Chinese fears in the 19th century and the so-called yellow peril that, that arose as a concept, this whole kind of imaginary. I think for a rhetorician, if your uh, rhetoric is always interested in audience-specific communication, so you're interested in the imagination Mythology and ideology, you have to accept where your audience is when you begin, which is not just uh, in full blown knowledge of the truth or anything, it's what passes for truth. And so, the you know, I studied some 19th century literature and book very briefly, but uh, there, were, there was a Chinese invasion of fiction mm -hmm. uh, craze in mm -hmm. the 19th century oh, that I that. used to kind of flesh out that imagination. Is it kind of like in dime novels or? Yeah. Yeah. Can we open it up? Let's do it. Yeah. Any questions from all of you or comments? Yeah, Stephen. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much to both of our authors. This has been a, a lot of fun. I learned a lot. And also to the organizers. I've got questions for both of you, but uh, great. I want to start with you uh, because I'm uh, intrigued about this notion of the controllers of time also being sort of de facto controllers of liberty, equality, and democracy. Uh, and I want to hear more about that. Uh, and I also wonder specifically what you mean by the controllers of time. One imagines guys with long beards <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I wonder if your conceptualization of the controllers of time also includes systemic controls. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in in such as media and how that, you know, an increasing rapidity of availability of information uh, has a direct effect on, on democracy and, and equality. Uh, or all of that. Um, yes, thank you, Stephen. So I think two initial ways to respond would be one way that I think um, the narrative of time gets controlled is looking at presidential rhetoric, and so maybe political rhetoric, but uh, in um, Benjamin Harrison's inaugural address, Rutherford B. Hayes before him made a similar appeal, but they frame the, um, the presidency and the transition to the presidency precisely in Harrison's term as letting the paralysis of slavery pass. And so part of the reconciliation effort between North and South is also a reconciliation over the legacy of slavery. And associating that history with paralysis, with stuckness, with stasis, um, is something that they quite baldly make an appeal to um, forget and leave behind. I think in, in another way, and here's a connection to, um, to, to the law, m much of the Supreme Court casework um, in the 1880s and the 1890s is about thinking about the relationship between racial discrimination in hotel accommodations, for instance, and its relation to racial slavery that, of course, has been legally ended by the 13th Amendment. But in the 1883 civil rights cases, for instance, the majority opinion um, disavows any connection between the history of racial slavery. It's just an accident. Right, yes. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and related to that, and we see this all the way um, 
to the present in uh, Sandra O'Connor's decision in the Michigan case, there's a, there's a desire in these um, 1880s court decisions to mark the end of racial inequality as, as it relates to slavery. And, and so an investment in the law in um, endpoints and, 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 and closing the book on a certain chapter of history, I think that would be um, one, one instance of the, um, of, of the way the system controls time. I'll ask another question about um, So I'm, I'm really interested um, in science and, and particularly scientific discussions about climate change. And this is also where this notion of, of reparations, I think, come in too, is we're sort of having to pay for the pollution of our, our predecessors and also consider ourselves as um, making decisions now that are going to affect generations to come. I'm wondering if there's any maybe connection we can make between uh, discussions about uh, issues of race and the problems that that uh, connects with and the problems of sort of the rhetoric of trying to persuade people to do something now that they're going to be dead by the time it makes any difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting. I don't know. I mean, it might, I have, I guess one way to think about it is there is a case to be made that you should not, as Jefferson said, bind future generations by, by your own present desires or, or problems, right? The, 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 the risk values, there, yeah. right, right. Um, and so that's, that's a, um, that one way to think about liberty. I guess I'd want to consider more what are the, the salient differences between the environmental case and the racial case, but do you, what are your what are your thoughts? I don't know. It seems like it's a. I mean, I guess, there's a, I guess the problem is that when you're trying to make the argument for like liberty, like oh, well, you'll be buying the people of the future. Well, they're mm -hmm. like, well, but I like my my SUV and mm -hmm. I have a pretty comfortable life now. But I mean, I, I guess it's, it shows the challenges of trying to kind of make these arguments yeah. in the sense of trying to get people to make decisions now. I mean, if you look at it from sort of a market perspective, right? Why would I make? Why would I take on? Um, some kind of risk or loss of benefit in order to benefit other people that are in the future. Um, so I'm going to take all the costs, but they're going to get all the benefits. I'm going to be dead before I get for any benefit accrued. Because there, there are like, you know, 100 year time frames between what we do now and getting that carbon out of the atmosphere um, in the future. So I mean, we're almost living that sort of, that, I, I don't know, I, I guess I go back to the voice thing, like you're living sort of a, present future mm -hmm. um, in a way that's kind of interesting um, because there we have these projections about the future and what's going to happen in the future mm -hmm. which seems interesting because you know in the case of slavery it doesn't seem like we have this sort of this notion of this present uh, this future projection of this is what's going to happen how um, about how about the billboard that was just taken down there are black people in the future mm. You, did you did you know about that, James? No, no. Be, so this is CMU uh, uh, adjunct professor and artist Alicia Wormsley had a uh, part of John Rubin's billboard in East Liberty, and it said there are black people in the future. And the realty company claimed that she had fielded uh, objections to that slogan, and she demanded that it be taken down. Yeah, and public, pub, pub, hmm? yeah, uh, Eve Picker. Uh, protests now have reverse that decision, but I, I'm not sure what John Rubin and Alicia Wormsley are going to do. Anyway, I was just thinking that there's this futurist uh, discourse does exist, but it's polarizing, or at least by one person. <clears throat> I, I often think that the, the, the present moment Yes, all I can say is that I, I could not affirm that 
more heartily. And, and, and I think the connection to the previous question is, I think in narratives of democracy, if we just point to any instance of political rhetoric currently, that democratic claims or claims about politics in America generally sync up more easily with claims about the future. <laughs> and I know that's not, not exactly what what you were getting at with the environmental case, I think that's a different one. But one of the things I try to work through in the book is how can you have um, a democratic politics that appeals to the future, but is not presuming a corrected future? Or that denies the inequality in the present. That's right. Yeah. Well, your books are both very historical, but, they're, but they, don't, they don't read as foreign to us. I mean, even the cases in, in Doug's book, uh, book are very, they could be happening now. I wouldn't be surprised they are. somehow yeah. something was happening right now, and you would be documenting that. Marian? Uh, thank you for your talk, um, both of you. I think uh, mostly a question for Doug. Um, so I'm familiar with you know the work of both and the Peter Sasson and all that that looks at these you know, back to the back and the Indian Exclusion Act and the social construction of race that takes place around those. Um, those cases. For me, the, the sort of exciting contribution of your work was to bring into that discussion um, other things, uh, including um, political, national political rhetoric, you know, of, of the common enemy, you know, um, and to complicate in that way what it means to be a race, rather beyond sort of simply sort of tracking the history of what, you know, physiognomy or other kinds of, I should say simply, but tracking the history of physiognomy and other kind of racial characteristics and moving into how political discourse factors. At the same time, I didn't always see your work under sort of this guise of this sort of like that which is being constructed is race. I actually sometimes would think of it more as that which is being constructed is national belonging or citizenship or other things in which race is part of a cluster of interrelating um, components, but maybe not the primary one. So maybe it is the foreigner, or maybe it is um, you know the ally or the enemy, or maybe it is national uh, identity, or maybe it's geographical proximity. Um, something like Asian exclusion, but not always primarily race. So my question to you is, to what extent do you see race as the organizing factor in what you're talking about? And to what extent do you see it maybe as one of a cluster? Yeah. Right, yeah, it's a great question. So a lot of race scholars have looked at the sort of tensions and intersection of race and nationality, in particular other categories like religion, which factors into so many of the cases that I look at. And so it is complicated, I think, when you're talking about a, a racial requirement for a national identity, that they, they will get fused in many ways. And I think that they are fused in these cases. I do think race is, in many ways, a primary category in the cases. Explicitly it is, of course, but it it also uh, functions, I think my reading of the cases and the rhetoric in the cases is consistent with a lot of uh, racial scholarship that looks and tries to understand the fluidity of race, how it mutates, and uh, try to understand why and what the factors are, the contingencies that give rise to racialization in certain ways, in certain circumstances, and so on. So one of my sort of tentative conclusions, or uh, something I'm tempted to conclude is, is sort of generally true, is that race functions a lot like uh, any political group formation in the ways uh, that it changes if you look uh, and so in, in that sense, I'm, I'm not sure what the implications of that fusion are or the separation, the isolation of race from, from nationality. Does that make some sense? Yeah, and I want to sort of, I guess we're connecting into the present. I agree last night about uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Roe versus Wade, which is 
relief from the visa uh, debates and the wide relief from the visa in India, and in position in India, um, having this 10-year backlog, uh, you know, 10-year wait, whereas other uh, nationalities are um, you know, moving forward more quickly. And I can't help but wonder whether some of that cluster, even though race maybe has moved out of sight as the overt discourse, you know, it moved at the end, and the foreigner part has shifted forward. Um, still the same cluster, but we're with a different sort of uh, visibility and different appearance. Right, and we have that question with the immigration bars that have come up recently under the new administration. So the, the courts so far have seen those as, as racial, right? So I think a lot of people do still perceive this to be uh, racialized immigration discourse, but it's not as explicit as it was. That's what I was talking about, about why it's surprising that we see such an open political interpretation of of race and immigration in, in this period. Uh, so yes, I believe uh, as a practitioner, you have to be uh, aware of those discriminations, and I think they are evident on a, on a policy level. Bob, you have, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so first of all, I'm speaking from the Asian perspective, and I'm a Chinese American, and I have College. It's the title, and the subtitles. What it was, is, and should be. Um, the thesis is primarily that we have lost. And Del Banco talks mostly about the U.S. context. That's his. That's his primary point of reference. So that um, we have lost. There was once a sense of higher education as related to something other than uh, vocational preparation. Um, and he defines that as an orientation toward citizenship. And, and the way he thinks about citizenship is precisely the uh, reciprocity between different individuals and the notion that one would have to have a sense of the fullness of one's identities, the histories that make up an individual person and, and one's uh, local and national context. Um, and so he, he enumerates a list of principles um, about how college should realize that end. Um, and it's, it's both historical and um, future-oriented. But it's a very moving book. And, and he uncovers in the archive um, a, a diary entry from a student at a small college in North Carolina. And this is really the thesis of Del Banco's book. The student had just got back from a lecture. Um, and he writes in his diary, um, that his mission for college, his personal mission, is to learn how to think and how to choose. Mm -hmm. And so Del Banco's point is that the thinking part is probably something that colleges in the US are doing better than the choosing part. But how does one choose one's commitments um, as they intersect with questions of careers and economics, but also with um, the notion that one could be committed um, to 
an identity not just as uh, an, an employee or employer, but as a, as a, as a citizen of democracy. thing that I can distill from the authors I try to think about in the book is that they propose what we could think of as a sort of measurement between past and present to determine progress. And the measurement has to be more than contrast. So uh, we're really familiar and good at in the US with the contrastive narrative between past and present. Look, things were really bad and now they're good, or, or maybe it's the opposite. But how, how do you allow for um, similarity between past and present? So maybe one way to think about Make America Great Again, besides the notion of um, what moment in America's history is it harkening back to, um, is that. So, so what would happen if you engage in a, in a calculus of comparing past and present, and the result was something other than difference. How how would how would you think about sameness? And that might could be to Kathy your original question about how do you how do you consider the present moment in relation to America's past history? The only other thing I would say is um, the notion that comes up a lot in political discussions about being on the right side of history. Yes, that's a, um, a Repetition. Yeah, and I think there's a number of ways to read that. One of them is it's a call to action, right, to um, engage in some sort of agitation. Another way to read it, I think, is that it's what what vision of history is implicit in being on the right side of it. Um, so you could be on the wrong side of history or on the right side of history, but it seems to me that history there is still some sort of line. A wall. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Reading you'd be on one side or the other. And I'm curious your thoughts, Doug, about current rhetoric around immigration. I was listening to a Fresh Air interview with a young Iranian woman whose family went through a trial to become citizens, and she had the kind of bitterness you were talking about. And I was thinking about, you know, those early, early days of the Trump administration when people flocked to the airports and uh, the president calling. Uh, certain countries, shithole countries. You know, how, how do you see the kind of current rhetoric maybe reflecting back on some of the historical work that you've done? Well, it's striking to me, so I focus on this common enemy move and the transitivity of attributing wrongs to an external group as a way of kind of binding people together. And I think you see that in Trump's rhetoric from the very beginning with Mexicans and his original speech. And it, it feels very clumsy, but it's it's consistent. There's a drum beat mm -hmm. uh, to it, it, and it's very demonizing of of outside groups, particularly non-white groups, right? Which plays to his base. So unfortunately, I see uh, the same pattern in his rhetoric, particularly toward immigration, mm -hmm. and it's always. You know, it's people from the Middle East, so there's this Islamophobia, but it's also China, it's also Mexico. It's, it's, and, our, and our allies. I mean, and it's regardless of whether they're allies. Yeah. Or, yeah. But unfortunately, 
priorities. It's depressing to rank them, but um, it's impossible not to wonder if xenophobia, in a way, subsumes racism or the other way around. Mm -hmm. Right, so race is uh, conceived of or imagined as a biological category. Uh, it doesn't actually, in, in the cases I look at, that was almost entirely abandoned. Uh, they mostly looked at it as a cultural and political affiliation. Biological descent was not enough uh, for you to count as a free white person. Uh, so the, the intersection between xenophobia and racism is kind of blurred, in my opinion, in reality, although the category of race has a different in history. Mm -hmm. Right. I find it very concerning. I'm not, uh, I, I don't believe that it's anything more than a perpetuation of those sort of racialized immigration policies that we've already talked about, and it may perhaps only a kind of xenophobia, but um, uh, the, so immigration courts are not Article Three courts, so the Attorney General sort of can do that, but whether it's a good idea is another matter, and so uh, Immigration judges are already strained in terms of the time they can devote to any given case. And this just compresses that even more where they're effectively turned into a kind of machine, at least if they take the incentive. So it is an incentive, it's a strong incentive, it's an unfair incentive, so that judges who don't want to participate in this are discriminated against in, in their um, salaries, I, I take it and promotion. Um, so I see it as part of a consistent pattern in the administration of demonizing consumers. But it's part of this more underground or invisible type where on its face you can't uh, necessarily prove that that is motivated by a racial ideology. Except by looking at tweets and Except other contexts. <laughs> statement that the message will be reinstated per the wishes of the community. 
Um, it has a Pittsburgh City paper link. But um, next Wednesday, April 18th at 4 p.m., um, a panel discussion on the message's removal featuring the artist will be held at Kelly Strike One Theater mm -hmm. if anyone's interested in seeing where that dialogue will go. Yeah. So, Thank you. And at 4 p.m. is very tough. Um, so next Wednesday, 4 p.m. we can continue the conversation with food and drinks. Thank you so much for your questions and for your attention. And thank you.